Let's kick it off. We're on time here and I the, see people are joining here. So thanks everyone for joining us for this February uh, meetup session today, Data Science on AWS. Um, you made it here, so you are familiar with our meetup page. Um, we're running these events, Chris and me, every month. Um, today, we do have a, a very special guest, Kyuk Chang from the Amazon team. Um, he will talk about Amazon scale with PyTorch from research to production. So super, super interesting to see a little bit um, behind the curtains there, what um, the M5 team at Amazon is doing. And then Chris and me, we will talk about um, generative AI. So we've prepared a little um, session here. We'll talk a little bit about the recent innovations and we will also see some demos. So hopefully that's of interest for you all. Um, we're super excited. Um, Chris, anything else from your side? Any announcements? Uh, no, what's, um, are we going to talk about next month at some point? Do we know what we have next month? Yeah, next month we will, um, also talk about PyTorch. We will have someone from Meta <laughs> joining us. <laughs> There's a lot of happening in that space. Um, giving us an update about, um, PyTorch 2.0. So, um, the new version coming out, um, pretty soon. Um, and Matthias from Meta will give us a quick update on, on what's new and why um, it's, uh, yeah, why you should maybe look into that um, if you're a PyTorch fan. And uh, I think we also have another generative AI talk. I think, um, I think it's, it's the season. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, with that, I don't want to hold off here for too long because um, we do have an exciting agenda for today. Um, quick housekeeping. If you have any questions there, um, please feel free to put them in the chat window. Make sure to send them to everyone so we can see all the questions. And then Chris and I will um, will go and keep an eye on the chat. And also um, when Cook is done with his session, we'll do um, a quick Q&A as well. So keep your questions coming there. All right, and with that, uh, let me stop my screen share and Cook, stage is yours. All right, thank you. So, just put this in presentation mode. There we go. All right, so hey, hey everyone, um, thanks for joining us uh, in on Presence Day. Uh, so my name is Cook. And I'm a principal engineer in uh, Amazon. And this is a bit of a rerun of my talk in the PyTorch conference uh, last December. But I am going to throw in a couple of, um, you know, things that are more relevant to the audience here, uh, especially, especially when, when you're running AI workloads on AWS. Um, so a bit about my, myself. Uh, I've been working at Amazon for, about six and a half years now. Um, and in the middle, I left Amazon to work for PyTorch uh, at Facebook for about three and a half years. And I authored uh, libraries around PyTorch like Torch Elastic, which is now actually part of PyTorch Distributed and uh, Torch X. Cool. All right. Um, this talk, when I gave the talk in the PyTorch conference, I actually had a co-presenter Pooja. Uh, unfortunately, she's not here with us today, but I did want to mention that the slides were uh, co-authored by uh, myself and Pooja. So all the credit to her. Cool. All right. So I am uh, part of the Search Science and AI organization, which is a applied research org within the broader Amazon search org. And what we do is we try to build state-of-the-art universal semantic representations of Amazon entities. So that's quite a bit of a mouthful. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is actually sort of parse this statement down so that we're all on the same page about what we are after in, um, in, in the search science and AI organization. Cool. So first, we have to understand what Amazon entities are. And essentially, what these are, are these are things that make up make Amazon Amazon, right? So. You can think of these as the nouns of Amazon. So things like products, obviously Amazon sells uh, different types of things um, and it's the everything store. So we have products as one of the entities. We have reviews that are associated to those products. Um, the customers obviously are very important entities for us um, and our sellers. 
the shopping sessions that our customers engage with um, at, when they're shopping at Amazon um, and others. So these are just kind of the, the prime examples of what we consider to be Amazon entities. So as you can see, this is not just one, but we have many different types of Amazon entities. All right, and remember how we said that we wanted to train these semantic representations, um, but we also wanted them to be universal. So what do we mean by universality, right? Um, and what we do is we split universality across five different categories. Um, and the first one is entity. So we just saw in the previous slide that at Amazon, we have multiple types of entities. So we wanna be able to capture uh, very accurate semantics of each entities, but also the relationships between entities as well, right? So there may be very tight co correlations between a product and a review um, or a review with a specific seller or reviews coming from a specific customer. So we wanna be able to capture the different types of relationships between these entities. Uh, the second category is modality. Um, customers interact with Amazon uh, in various types uh, and forms. So the most obvious way is by text. So when you're browsing at Amazon through our web browser or mobile app, you're reading a lot of text, you know, product descriptions, reviews, and things like that. But you're also looking at the visual things that come out of it as well. So you may be looking at images of um, specific products or video uh, that somebody uploaded reviewing a product. And then you have the, the, the a, a little bit less um, obvious ones, like when you're conversing with um, you know Amazon devices like Alexa, right? So we have speech in there, we have audio um, as well as visual and text. So we have we have a lot of different types of modalities um, that come in as you know data sets for us, and we want to be able to you know really extract out a lot of information from these modalities so that we can have better semantic representations of the aforementioned entities. Um, the next two categories being multilingual and multilocal have to do with the fact that Amazon is a global marketplace. So we have to cater to um, different types of marketplaces uh, across the globe. And obviously these marketplaces all sort of speak the, um, you know, speak different languages. They have different cultures um, and tastes, right? So we wanna be able to capture um, in a very global and universal way, the different types of um, locales and, and, and languages. And then finally, um, we, want, we want these uh, semantic representations to really be relevant and um, useful for multiple types of downstream tasks. So as you can imagine, um, there's, there's not just one or two tasks when we, you know, when we wanna power up the Amazon uh, retail website. You know, there's there's tasks ranging from you know robots in warehousing all the way up to uh, us recommending products for you. So we want to be able to really capture these semantic representations in such a way that these are you know both relevant and also useful for various downstream tasks um, across different organizations at Amazon. So essentially, in a, in a nutshell, what we want to do is our, our grand sort of idea is that we ingest all of the data that Amazon has and then be able to generate these you know, semantic representations, which eventually are, are really mathematical vectors um, for all of the Amazon entities that we have. All right, so before I get started, oh, sorry. The other thing to mention was because we split the universalities um, across five different categories, the specific project itself is called M5. Um, and I'm going to be referring to M5 quite a bit through the rest of this talk. All right, so before I get started on um, M5 itself, uh, some of the, you know, at the time, this was a shout out for some of the PyTorch ecosystem libraries that was really making research to production um, on the cloud easy for us. But now it's, you know, it's been three months. So it's really a, um, uh, a display of the PyTorch ecosystem libraries that have really helped us out and that we, we use from a day-to-day -day perspective. Um, and the first one is Torch Data. So Torch Data was useful for us because one, um, 
we really like the data pipe um, interface more than the data set interface. We, we felt like it does address a lot of the reusability and um, componentization issues that we that we dealt with with uh, torch data uh, the, 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 the torch, the torch data um, interface and the good part of this is that the data pipe interface is really interface compatible with the data set interface and so you can create data pipes you can actually the way it's designed is that you can chain data pipes with different type of transforms uh, and this is very similar to using um, rem, uh, rdds in spark or data sets in Spark, or sorry, data frames in Spark. Um, and then you can basically feed in that chain of data pipes into your data loader so that you can start ingesting data that's been pre-processed and transformed um, into your, your, your model training process. Um, the other thing that is relevant for this audience and for AWS is that Torch Data out of the box supports uh, a few data pipes that are meant to read from S for, uh, data sets in S3. So there's actually two different types of ways you can read data from S3 and ingest them into your training jobs with Torch Data. The first one is by using the FS spec data pipe. And the, uh, and the second one is um, there is a C plus or, or a PI binded C++ um, binding for using the S3 C++ client under the hood but it is binded with PyBind so that you can call the download and upload functions from Python. And that actually helps with some throughput issues that you may or may not see with um, FS spec for different types of data sets. And I can, I can um, go into that in, in a bit of uh, detail uh, towards the end of the talk if we have some time. But, um, and I, I can also point you folks to uh, some of the benchmarks that I ran that's been made public um, on you know, when you should use uh, which type of technology to read data from S3 in a more performant manner. Cool. Um, the second one is Torch Snapshot. So, you know, once you train your model, you obviously have to save it somewhere so that you can reload them for inference. Or if your job fails, you want to be able to regularly checkpoint these uh, these models. Um, and, and so, you know, AWS, obviously it's the cloud. Things are very ephemeral by nature. Things may fail. So you should design your applications in a fault tolerant manner. And the best way to do that, the easiest way to do that actually for a deep learning job is to be able to uh, checkpoint your state um, from time to time very regularly so that you don't lose too much progress. And uh, Torch Snapshot really helps us do this. Um, it supports uploading your snapshots to S3 out of the box. Uh, but the more important part is if you have distributed training, what it supports is it has off the shelf support for uh, doing sharded and distributed saves. So this is the part where it really um, distinguishes itself from uh, torch.save because with torch snapshot, if your model is sharded, if your model state is sharded um, across multiple workers during training, each worker will only save their portion of the shard. So you can really leverage the throughput of all of the machines that are involved. Um, and then when you reload the model um, onto a different job, you perhaps may have scaled the job up or down based on the availability of the machines. And uh, what Torch Snapshot does is it can basically grab the checkpoints that were saved with, you know, let's say four workers and then load them into another job that is um, reloading the checkpoint in, uh, in into either two workers or eight workers. So that is, is um, quite a bit of a convenience for uh, folks that deal with distributed training quite a bit. Cool, and lastly is uh, TorchX. Um, TorchX is a job launcher specifically designed to launch PyTorch applications. Um, the nice part about TorchX is that it supports multiple uh, varieties of schedulers. So TorchX, I believe today supports anywhere between like seven to eight different types of schedulers. So it supports um, Kubernetes, you know, launching onto Slurm clusters, uh, launching onto AWS Batch, GCP batch, Azure batch, and I believe IBM added support for LSF schedulers. So regardless of you know what scheduler you have been set up with, TorchX probably can launch into one of those schedulers. It actually also supports launching into array uh, cluster as well. Um, and the nice thing about TorchX is that 
you're interacting with the job launcher at the application layer. So what the typical usage is you author your PyTorch script as you would do normally, and then you ask TorchX to launch your application. And in the process, what TorchX will do is it will look at your environment, it'll then containerize your environment, send it over to the cloud, and then have the remote scheduler um, actually start executing your job. All right, so some of the PyTorch modules, I think next week, Matthias is probably gonna cover you know, PyTorch 2.0, but um, we're actually uh, uh, already starting to experiment with Torch Dynamo uh, because of the, you know, the size of the models, uh, as well as we always wanna take our models to inference. So Torch Dynamo really um, gives us a more generic way of, um, performing some optimizations, some graph optimizations on our modules uh, without having to sit down and torch script everything. So it is a, a, a more convenient way for us to um, apply certain transforms and optimizations. Um, torch distributed FSDP, um, we were originally built um, a lot on deep speed, uh, but we wanted to sort of move to a more PyTorch native model so we have been uh, converting some of our models into uh, uh, using Torch, uh, the, the FSDP module that's built in with PyTorch. And we've had uh, a quite a bit of success in, in, in converting some of our flagship models into FSDP. Um, and Thump Torch, so we haven't really used Thump Torch that much. Um, I've been experimenting with it a bit. Um, and, and the reason I like it a lot is because it makes certain things you know, more uh, canonically expressible um, with Functorch APIs uh, than just regular PyTorch APIs. So I won't get into too much details on, on Functorch, but it is something that to, to look at if you have found like the regular PyTorch APIs to be a little bit awkward for a specific type of logic that you want to uh, represent. So things like VMAP is a good example. Um, and, and so you want to be able to then leverage the, you know, specific APIs that um, Functorch has, and it just makes things uh, a lot more natural to express in code. All right, so back to M5, um, our, our journey of an M5 model from all the way from experiment to when it reaches our end users um, is actually quite obvious. So we, we you know, I've, I've split our stages um, of, of an M5 model into three different parts. So the first one is experimentation. So we have to develop the model, right? So we want to be able to train these models to eventually capture a lot of these semantic representations. Um, and so the experimentation phase is where our engineers and scientists really go out and um, try out different types of model architectures, as well as different data sets, different data, data uh, pre-processing transforms, different types of training paradigms and training regimens. So they may be wanting to use different optimizers or different you know, learning rate schedulers, as well as different types of sharding algorithms and scales um, or, or distributed um, uh, uh, scales. And uh, it really helps us um, understand our, you know, our models, you know, how big they need to be, you know, what we're learning and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then once these models actually um, yield good results offline, uh, we take them and then we essentially uh, productize them. So at this point, our customers or, you know, downstream teams can take these models and start running A-B tests, online A-B tests. Uh, and so what we need to do is before we actually start running the online A-B test, we need to productionize, productionize these models, right? Because online tests actually um, influence our customers. They are very customer facing. So even if they're actually just running like a, you know, a hypothesis test on, you know, uh, uh, online, uh, we want to make sure that um, all of our Amazon customers um, have the same type of uh, experience at Amazon. So we want to make sure that these are up to our production standards. So what we typically do is we clean up the model code. Um, we optimize parts of it where we can, because these are going to be deployed to production systems. Um, and we, we make sure it, uh, you know, all the models are documented. Um, and uh, sometimes if the models are very popular and a lot of 
downstream teams use them. We actually just tort script them right. You know, we we do it ourselves instead of you know having our end users do it um, because it kind of benefits uh, a lot of folks. So we do do these four models that are um, that we know that just get deployed um, into online inference services directly. And then the third phase is you know once the models have been prioritized and cleaned up, uh, we vend these models through our internal model hub. And I'll cover this. I'll cover these three stages uh, a bit more in detail um, in the next few slides. All right. So the first uh, step is the experimentation phase, and what's really important in this phase is the speed of iteration and reproducibility. So what we do is we make sure we track all of these experiments um, along with their run metadata and all of the inputs, um, and we also archive the code that went into. Uh, these experiments. So sometimes, a lot of the times when scientists run experiments, they don't actually check in the code, right? They would want to launch jobs from their um, personal workspaces, or they just run it on their developer desktops. So what we do is every time somebody runs something, we basically package everything up, and then we just save that um, workspace artifact somewhere. Um, for the tracking of experiments and, and metadata, we currently use MLflow, uh, but we have been looking into um, moving some of that um, onto the uh, SageMaker experiments. Uh, the next thing is data. So all of these experiments at some point need data. And we have experimented with uh, a few forms of data storage solutions, and we ended up settling for S3. And the reason for that was because S3 scaled the best for the variety of data sets that we have and the variation of sizes between the data sets. So sometimes our data sets are only a few gigabytes big, and then other times they're essentially um, you know, dozens of terabytes big, right? So S3 really let us um, kind of store these, these variations of sizes and cardinality of data sets um, without having to deal with too much tuning or anything like that. So a lot of it was you know, convenience in terms of scale. One thing we did do on top of S3 was we built a solution called Data Kit on top of S3, which is essentially source code management for data sets. So we realized that with uh, a lot of these experiments that are being run, we wanted the data sets to really be immutable once they're associated to an experiment, right? So if you wanted to change a data set um, or an original data set, we essentially just make a copy and then we let the user sort of change or manipulate the original data set. But we wanted the pointers from the experiment to the data that they used um, to be immutable. And so we uh, essentially built a data set management solution um, on top of S3. So really what that is, is it's really just doing bookkeeping for the different types of data that we have um, as well as how they get transformed over time. So they, they support versioning, branching, um, and locality of data sets. And then um, the thing that is now available with Torch Data is um, some of our data sets, uh, we couldn't really read them with FS spec all that um, efficiently because the size of each shard was really big. And so with Python, sometimes you, you know, oftentimes you run into GIL issues, the uh, global interpreter lock issues. And so what we did was we used a S3 C++ plus client under the hood, but then we pi binded that so that we could actually use threading um, underneath um, and, and really get the throughput that we wanted. Cool. Then finally, it's the compute cluster, right? These jobs have to run in some type of compute cluster. We chose AWS Batch um, as the compute cluster. Uh, mostly because of the flexibility that it gives us. So we're able to, you know, um, we, we have specific types of accelerators that we run on. Uh, sometimes we run on GPUs, other times we run on other types of accelerators. And so we wanted to, we wanted a way for us to manage this capacity in an efficient manner. And AWS Batch was specifically built for running, you know, high performance computing jobs on the cloud. AI is just one form of a high performance computing job. Um, so a lot of the primitives like job queues and compute environments and how the job queue connects to the compute environment um, existed in a very natural form with AWS Batch APIs. So we chose that um, as our compute cluster um, solution. 
And um, an added benefit is that, you know, AWS Batch supports Docker containers. So, you know, it, there was a very canonical way for us to containerize or save our workspaces. Um, we essentially do that through um, Docker images. Um, probably something that is um, more relevant to folks here is that running AWS Batch, it's like AWS Batch itself has no service fee. So there's no service, you know, additional service surcharge other than the uh, EC2 instances and other AWS resources uh, that you use through it. All right, so the second phase, like um, once the models show good offline performance um, is to prioritize these models. And here the ease of use and performance is, is sort of the theme, right? So we realize that not everyone has access to the best hardware downstream. So we may be training on a P4 um, instance with A100 GPUs, but another team downstream may be smaller, you know, or they may have budget constraints. So they may be running on a V100 or a P3 instance, or sometimes they might not even have GPUs, right? <clears throat> so what we do is we oftentimes distill very large models into smaller ones <clears throat> so that our, our uh, you know, downstream teams don't really need specialized hardware or proficiency in dealing with you know, big models and distributed training. Um, uh, and, and this really yield our models to be uh, more portable and more practical to use. Um, and these models, by the way, they get either used directly um, or you know, put into inference services, or um, they may be just generating embeddings offline, or folks might take them and, and further fine tune them uh, for their particular tasks. Um, some of the models that we know that are going to um, inference directly, uh, we torch script them. And we do that specifically because um, a lot of our services are not written in Python. They're either C++ or Java services. So torch scripting them um, is kind of a requirement for us so that uh, we can run them on a no Python runtime. Um, and then the, the third point here is that um, we also package up our data pre-processing code. So this is sometimes overlooked as, hey, I just need to save the model and optimize the model so that I can vend them. Well, the model was trained with a specific set of transformations or data pre-processing logic. And um, a lot of the times it doesn't actually make sense for the model to be packaged up alone. It actually has to go with the code, uh, with the data pre-processing code that it went. So we, we, we make sure we package up our data sets or data pipe implementations um, and vend them um, along with the model uh, itself. Cool, um, some metrics before I get to the final stage. Um, <clears throat> we have about uh, 210 teams using M5 products across Amazon. Excuse me. Um, and then our, our month over month growth um, in the past year has been about 20%. Um, and we have about a hundred plus teams using our pre-computed embeddings. All right. So the final stage is vending. So once the model has been productionized, you know, documentation, unit tests, you know, everything has been added. We then put these models along with their data pre-processing code into a model hub. And the theme here is reliability and user centricity. So we want it to be very easy for users to access the uh, models that we have. And we also want it to be very self-service and then discovering different types of models um, as well as sort of playing around with what these models can enable them to do. Um, and, you know, it being Amazon, we always like to do the 99, the three nines of uh, reliability. So we we'll wanna always make sure that our models themselves are well-tested um, and, and, and they will actually run on the runtimes that we, we promised them, um, but also that the model hub itself is, is running smoothly and that uh, folks can actually start downloading um, from, model, from our model hub, which is internally called Bazaar, um, from their production jobs, right? <clears throat> cool. Um, we also benchmark a lot of our models with a set of tasks. And um, we also upload the results up in the uh, model hub through our model cards. Um, and we always evolve the benchmark suites uh, to 
you know, incorporate different types of uh, downstream tasks and, um, you know, uh, make sure that the metrics that we're uh, projecting out to our customers are actually an accurate measure of model quality and their relevance to the, to the tasks. Cool. And with that, I do want to leave a, a bit of time for questions. So I am going to skip over the model vending deep dive. Um, it's actually, it's, it's, it's not too complicated. It's, you know, I've kind of covered parts of it where we sometimes script some of these models. Um, and then uh, we also vend data pre-processing code as well. Cool. Um, and the last thing to mention is that, you know, M5 is always evolving. So it's really um, important for us to go back to our downstream teams um, and, and collect feedback on what works, what doesn't. Uh, we also grab a lot of data from those teams themselves because they're the ones that are actually serving customer traffic uh, with the models that we have. So we build these very tight partnerships so that you know our models that are being used to improve the other teams, you know, uh, products. Then we can grab the data feedback that comes out of that and then uh, improve our models. So it's really this feedback loop that we have. Um, and really the bottom line is, you know, M5 improves the research to production velocity for teams across Amazon. So the first you know, point here is that you get a warm start, right? So if you use some of our models, you don't have to pre-train the models yourself. Um, you can kind of start from a place where um, we've captured some good semantical representations, hopefully, for the type of tasks that you might have in hand. Um, and that makes it very resource efficient for Amazon, right? So we have a central team, uh, not only like from a hardware perspective in training these models, but also from a knowledge and talent perspective, we really have a central team that is sort of learning from this feedback loop, um, what models work, what models don't. And then from a hardware perspective, we pre-train these models once or twice, and then have a lot of teams downstream just fine tune them, which is a lot more resource efficient than if every team were training their models themselves. Um, and then finally, the best practices. So because we make the mistakes first, we deal with a lot of scale, um, we can sort of uh, ensure that the best practices live through our models. And that ends up helping um, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, the quality and, um, and uh, you know, downstream teams um, at Amazon. Cool. Um, so that was it for my talk. So thank you. Um, and then I, I can I, I can be here for another 10 minutes to answer any questions. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Cook. Really appreciate it. It's, it's great yeah. to get those insights. A um, few questions here. You mentioned earlier semantic representations on mathematical entities. Mm -hmm. um, could you share a little bit additional perspective on this? Yeah, so what I meant by that was that uh, like the semantic representations that we that we're referring to is is a vectorized form of um, of the entities, right? So like a product, uh, you know, we call them ASINs. So an ASIN maps to a specific uh, product in our catalog. So instead of representing that with like this is the title of the product, this is the identifier of the product, we'll say, hey, this is like a hundred and twenty eight dimensional vector. Uh, where the elements are like floating point numbers. And that becomes this abstract you know, representation that may not make sense to you from a human being perspective, but once fed into the model that actually represents a point in space. All right, um, another <clears throat> question, where are the models safe? Do you have a platform for people to find and try the models? I think you mentioned a model hub, right? You're using internally. Yeah, so yeah, we have a, like a user interface, like a web internal website where people can go, it'll list out all of the models. You can search the models. It's it's very similar to what you would find in places like Hugging Face, um, <clears throat> but it's obviously internal to Amazon. Uh, there are models that we train that are, uh, you know, depending, you know, one difference really with Hugging Face is that there are models that we train with different classifications of data. So with the most open classification of data, we can open up those models to many, many teams. But then if we're training models with a very you know, stringent 
uh, stringently classified data, then you need to get whitelisted for reading that model, right? So we do apply very strict permissioning on the models depending on you know where they came from and what data they have access to. Um, so people can basically essentially go there, you know, search for models. They can look at the model cards um, and play around with it. Um, perfect. Another quick one. Can where is it? <laughs> um, can people annotate the? Where's the question? I lost it. Um, sorry. The can people annotate the downstream the archive data set and model downstream users? Can they annotate it? Archive data sets um, and models. I guess it is a question more like, can I annotate it and then put it back into the model hub for the annotations to be accessible to other users? <laughs> yeah, I think the letter. Yeah, so today we actually don't have, it's, it's a read-only access to our model hub. So you won't be able to you know, take our models, annotate it, and then upload it back yourself. You will have to work with you know, our, our vending team to be able to do that. Now that said, we we don't you know we don't prevent you from doing it. It's just that it's not a full self service mechanism at the moment. Okay. And then maybe one question um, I had, and we had a brief chat about this. So there sure. are different ways to to read <clears throat> data from S three, right? And um, that that might be confusing to users. Um, so from your perspective, you know the the FS spec you mentioned um, versus the S three I O. Um, what were your findings there? Benchmarks like what's What's your take on this house, the most efficient way to read the data? Yeah, so I guess the, there's there's a bit of a decision tree there. Um, so a bit of a background on the ways that FSPEC versus the S3 IO, which is the, the PyBind, the C++ client methodology. Um, they both try to hide uh, latency um, to increase throughput. And so the way FSPEC does it is through a package called AI, AIO Protocore. And so what that one does is it uses um, cooperative thread, or not cooperative thread, but uh, cooperative um, uh, parallelization. So it is able to use async IO in Python to be able to submit the, the download tasks as async tasks. And then in the you know in, in the meanwhile, it can go and sort of share the, the same uh, Python process, right? Whereas the S3IO, what it does is it delegates the parallelization to C++ and then it uses threading under the hood. So <clears throat> the first decision, so what I found in most cases, really the bottom line is they have very similar performance characteristics when it comes to throughput. S3IO is slightly faster anywhere between about 10 to 30% faster in terms of uh, throughput, but it's also less portable in the sense that because it's C++ code, the code itself has to be compiled for your particular architecture, right? So if you're running on, on you know, it'll, it'll work for most like x86 architectures, but if you're running in a very particular setup or a particular operating system, it might not work out of the box for you. So I've had issues with like TLS um, encryption with uh, like running it on like our AL2 versus Ubuntu. And so there's ways to get around it, but it might not just work out of the box, right? So if you're looking for more portability, um, then go with FSpec. That kind of like saves you from that headache mm -hmm. of, of dealing with the C++ stuff. Um, if you're using EFA enabled devices, right? You have a lot more throughput to play around with. So that 10%, 30% savings can really amount to a lot of dollar savings for you because you're using these very expensive instances. So in that sense, then you might as well go with um, you know, S the, the S3 IO. The other thing to consider is the size of your shards, right? If you have a really large shard, right? <clears throat> um, you're better off using the S3 IO because a lot of the time you're, you know, you're gonna be spending like reading in the large shard and you want that to be very performant. Whereas if you have like very, you know, 50 megabytes or, you know, anywhere between like 50 to 200 megabytes size shard, and you have a lot of them, then you might as well um, use FSpec because the, the performance difference is not, not going to be that big. All right, perfect. <clears throat> Got it. 
Yeah, I think in the interest of time, um, we'll we'll let you go here, Cook. Um, maybe you can have a That's minute good. in the chat if there's anything um, unanswered. Um, Chris, you made um, my point, Cook, to anything. Um, anything you want to call out, Chris, quickly? Um, I think we're good. Yeah, the yeah. ML flow questions come up a couple times. Uh, essentially, move to StageMaker experiments would be a, a move to free the team from having to manage its right. own ML flow uh, cluster, yeah. right? Yeah. And as yeah. of December 2022, we now support um, a experiments API that's very similar to ML flow runs and start run and all that stuff. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so Thank much, man. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Okay, All right. Yeah, you're up next, right? I'm up next. Um, let me bring up my slides here. And then we'll jump into the next topic, which is generative AI. So let me share my screen here. And just for context, Ancha worked all weekend on this uh, talk. So, <laughs> so this is not only the latest and greatest, but it is uh, like literally hot off the press. So, hot off the well, press. Thanks, Ancha, for working so hard. <laughs> sure. So, um, okay. I think, uh, as I mentioned before, it is the season, right? Um, everyone is talking about generative AI and a couple of recent announcements and, and launches there. So um, I've put together here a deck um, with Chris to walk you through um, quickly a little bit of what, what happened in the industry and also do some demos in the end. So um, quick agenda, it looks like a lot. Um, I'm gonna keep it um, as, as short and crisp as I can here, but we're touching on a couple of things. Um, obviously why data science in the cloud, I think most of us understand, but just a quick recap. Um, we'll go into the generative AI use cases, including generating images, generating code and text with different models and architectures. And uh, if we have time at the end, a quick, um, really quick, look into the evolution of NLP and what happened there in the last couple of years and then almost couple of weeks. All right, let's dive right into it. So why do we talk about data science and ML in the cloud? And I think to most of us, this is this is fairly obvious. We start developing and experimenting locally, um, local IDEs, our laptop development servers. But at one point, um, we're running out of resources, right? We're, we're hitting memory boundaries, we're hitting CPU performance boundaries. So at one point we have to move to a different infrastructure and the cloud is really a great way to, to help us scale our work in a sense that it's giving us an elastic on-demand infrastructure, meaning we can, what we call scale up, scale down easily. Let's say you're, um, picking one type of compute instance in the cloud, um, you're hitting limits, you can, you know, move to a bigger instance that has more memory, um, more performance CPUs, or you can also do the scale out, scale in approach, meaning maybe you're switching, you know, from single node uh, model training to distributed training, and you're just, you know, adding more instances and scale out your training to be more efficient and faster. And not just up and out, but you can also scale down and in again. So meaning when your work is done, um, most of the infrastructure, you know, you scale it down again, you terminate it, or if you're using a managed service that will do it for you. So really just using and paying for the resources um, that you're using. Also, the cloud offers purpose-built hardware. I'm going to have a slide on that um, later that gives you access, you know, to, to the latest GPUs, to the latest um, different um, compute infrastructures and architectures um, that is really optimized for the job you want to do. And also, we just heard about it, um, S3, for example, as data storage. Um, the cloud is really helping you to store and process any amount of data. At one point, your local laptop will say, oof, too much, right? <laughs> In the cloud, you can easily um, you know, process really large data sets as well and just, um, yeah, process any amount. Also, the cloud gives you a toolbox, right? We have a lot of different services there, um, different offerings, technologies. So you have your little ML toolbox that helps you achieve the job. 
Um, when I talk about the toolbox, here's the example from AWS. Um, there's a lot of services available. Um, the AI services are pre-built services that are ready to be used with just an API call and available for the different tasks. So whether you do, you know, um, working with images, vision, um, there's a service called um, Amazon Recognition, if you're working with speech, with text, if you want to build a chatbot, etc. Um, those services are already um, pre-built, so super easy to get started using. Most of the time, and, and we've done this in this um, meetup series as well, we, we showed you a lot of different ways to build your own ML projects using a toolbox called Amazon SageMaker, which is still a managed service and takes care of the infrastructure, but gives you a lot of specific functionality, whether it's you need help labeling data, um, storing features, um, do data processing, and then obviously the, the core ML development from, you know, jumping into um, notebook environments, um, building, training the models, and also deploying models later. And then as uh, another layer, obviously, if you want to do everything yourself, if you want to, you know, build your own um, infrastructure here, you can tap into really um, the low level in terms of, hey, I just grabbed my EC2 instance. Um, I want to work with specific GPUs maybe and then uh, manage that infrastructure for various reasons um, yourself. And most of the time we're talking about this managed platform, but I want to show you here a little bit about the purpose-built hardware. Um, just quick, um, there's a lot of um, compute power available and different instance types, um, whether it's for machine learning training or for inference. And you will see here the optimized instances, for example, for training um, the different um, series of NVIDIA GPUs you might want to use, or we have support for Habana Gaudi from Intel. And AWS also offers um, purpose-built custom silicon um, for training. It's called AWS Trainium, um, and it's available in the TRN1 instances. And also for Inference, we just recently at reInvent launched Inferentia 2, the new second generation Inferentia chip, um, which is currently in preview in the Inf2 instances. Um, getting out soon as SGA. And this is really optimized to run large scale distributed inference. And those inferences with a custom silicon um, are there to give you a really great price performance um, point. So here quickly, um, just a couple of numbers, um, whether you're looking for, you know, purpose-built training infrastructures, uh, maybe with the Trainium chips or um, for inference with the Inferentia chips, um, they're really highly optimized. Um, Inferentia 2 gives you a distributed um, inference capability, so you can deploy really, really large models. Um, that is specifically interesting right now in the context of generative AI and then um, run that even on, on a single large instance there. All right, I'm not going to go too deep into those um, for now because we want to talk generative AI. So let's go into this. Um, quick recap, what, what is generative AI, right? Um, I think most of us get a good understanding from, from seeing the examples out there. Um, we talk about generative AI in a sense that it's able to generate, to produce content that looks almost like human generated right for for a real world task like um there's the text prompt and then the model generates an image out of that right give me an image of a um of an astronaut um sitting in a in a sun chair or something and then the the model creates a, a fun image there um it can create text um, we've seen that recently um, there's, you know, models that create music, that um, create videos. So basically generating original content from just a few prompts. We also speak about foundation models, right? So in the past, we talked about um, specifically about um, big models in the NLP, natural language processing space, um, large language models. And we switch to call them foundation models because they're pre-trained on really large sets of data, which we have done before. Um, but now those foundation models can be used for, for various different tasks. And we can do this with just minimal fine tuning of those foundation models, which is super exciting. And in general, um, generative AI helps um, reduce time and cost. 
um, to develop MM models and help you innovate faster because we can now leverage um, those big foundation models that are already really, really good at a lot of different tasks. All right, so I mentioned a couple of use cases. Um, there's there's many more right now being explored, um, but let's just focus on the main three, which is image generation, um, code generation, and text generation. And let's start with the first one, image generation. Here's an example of how those models um, learn to create images. And one type um, of model architectures is called diffusion models. So you can see here in those animations how they work. The first step is to um, take images and then basically gradually add Gaussian noise to them. So they basically destroy the data, um, adding that noise. And then they're trained to create images from that noise. So basically denoising um, the code again. And in the past, we, we talked a lot about the GANs, right? GAN networks. Um, they, they work a little different in, in a sense that um, they, they basically generate an image and then another component basically says whether um, the generated image was, was good enough, right? Was really kind of um, what is expected and they basically compete and, and improve there. Here, it's really kind of a different way um, to train the model by adding the noise and then learning to denoise. And the nice thing about diffusion models is also you can train them to um, to work off text, right? So you can give them a prompt, and this is what we're seeing these days, and then create images from that text prompt. Um, I go back away from those <laughs> animations. So one of the most popular uh, models right now, one of them is a stable diffusion by Stability AI. Um, they just released um, the second uh, model here, Stable Diffusion 2.0. And it's really, really impressive if you see what, what those models can do. So on the left here, you see an image from an interior that actually does not exist, right? You just um, typed in some text and described how the model um, should create an image, and this is the output. Really amazing. Um, they also um, have capabilities um, to do transformation of images, as you can see here too. So um, this is helping you know to to replace images, or even here, what you also see to upscale the res resolution of images. So a lot of different ways, um, a lot of different, um, let's say, use cases um, to do with those models. Okay, so quick time check. We have about uh, yeah. six, seven minutes, and we want to get to the. Yep, cool. Yeah, perfect. Um, let's quickly talk about code generation, and and here I want to just quickly show you um, a tool that Amazon released a service um, also um, last year and went, which is called Amazon Code Whisperer. Um, think of Code Whisperer as a coding companion. Um, you can use it from within your favorite IDE. Um, whether it's um, Visual Studio Code, JetBrains, Cloud9, Lambda Console. And you can just install um, the Code Whisperer plugin. You just need to sign up with an um, email address, which is super cool. And then you can start typing comments and Code Whisperer suggests um, code blocks here. And also it generates any open source attribution um, if the code you know, um, seems to be taken from, uh, from an example out there. So you have the, the attributions as well, which is super, super important. All right, I'll go a little bit quick because we want to see a demo. And then obviously, if you if we go into the text generation, um, one of the famous ones, ChatGPT out there, you give it a prompt, you give it a text, and then the model generates um, either an answer, it summarizes code, it generates um, text. Um, so super, super exciting um, to see those models in action. Um, there's not just ChatGPT, there is, there's other models out there, um, for example, Bloom, which has been trained in a completely transparent environment um, by the Big Science Initiative, um, really helping you, you know, to help advance the whole research, giving you access to open source large language models. And this one has been trained in 117 days, and it's, uh, it's deeply integrated with um, the Hugging Face Transformer library. 
And similar way, um, you give it a prompt, a text prompt, and then the model starts generating text. Um, Quick block blue models um, are also available through SageMaker. Um, we do have um, foundation models that are available through the SageMaker Jumpstart environment to help you get, uh, get access to those publicly available um, foundation models. Um, I say I do have a quick note here on prompt engineering, um, just to give you a quick um, heads up, and then I'll hand it over to Chris to go through some demos. So I've mentioned prompt a lot of times, and I guess we all heard it <laughs> um, in the news. What a prompt does is really helping guide the model to generate useful output. So this can be a simple question like who won the most recent World Cup as the input to the large language model LLM, and then we receive um, the generated text, which hopefully is the right answer to our question. Um, prompts can also provide context, right? So you can give it a little bit more information. I just tested here um, the model to write me a country song that includes specific terms. And the model came back with what sounds like a good country song. And you can also give um, like work in a stateful environment and combine those prompts. So as a follow-up, I just said, now write a rap song. And the model was able to capture that context with the terms I wanted to have in there and apply to, to this new follow-up question here. All right. Um, I think with that, um, Chris, why don't you take over and run us through a couple of examples here? Uh, yeah, do you want to get to the evolution one real quick in the chat GPT uh, up to slide 35? Can you just like talk about those quickly and then cut out and then I'll do the two demos afterward? Okay, yeah, let me let me see. We're going to keep recording. All right, let me quickly go into, because I know there's always a lot of interest how ChatGPT works. Let's do them. Um, really quick um, on the evolution, here's an overview of what happened um, from 2013 to 2018. And NLP kind of started to be in, in the spotlight again. Um, 2013, early version of NLP algorithms, Vertuvec, still, still pretty famous, um, that is basically a shallow neural network um, creating those bag of words and continuous script, skip gram, what they were called, to process um, text inputs and, and vectorize them. Um, there were a different, couple of different architectures. Um, GLOF used global vectors um, for virtual representations um, in kind of a matrix vectorization. Um, fast text was an extension to Vertuvec. Um, instead of, um, you know, the, the skip grams, it did subwords like called n-grams of words. And then the biggest revolution really was um, kind of with the uh, transformer architecture that came out in summer 2017 um, in this very famous paper, Attention is All You Need, um, where the authors proposed this transformer architecture um, and also um, introducing this concept of self-attention. So basically looking at um, the context of a word in the whole sentence to kind of get a better um, understanding and the importance of each word. Um, there were a couple of iterations. Blazing text was um, yet another implementation of fast text on AWS, improving there. Um, Elmo tried out different architecture using um, LSTMs, but really kind of um, the biggest model architectures that kind of got a lot of popularity and are still used in, in, in one form or the other um, are GBT and BIRD. So fun fact, GPT, BIRD, the T stands for transformer. So those architectures really built on top of this transformer um, architecture in kind of different implementations. Um, GBT in its first version here um, applied this unidirectional attention, um, which was getting good results, but really kind of, I think when BERT came out later that year um, that implemented this bi-directional attention. So understanding context from the left and understanding context from the right, um, which really kind of um, helped improve um, how the NLP model, um, you know, is able to, to provide accurate um, outputs. So BERT is still in use um, in, in a lot of uh, different settings. Um, 
GPT improved. So I think if you look at the recent innovations here, GPT-3 that came out in June 2020 kind of started a whole um, kind of um, excitement in the industry. GPT-3 by OpenAI is kind of a, you know, a proprietary model. Um, but that kind of started, and I took that slide here from the State of AI report that showed how that one triggered the open source community to start developing open source models, LLMs, large language models. And you can see the, the open source ones here in red. But really kind of um, a lot of people in the industry jumped at um, creating additional models here. Um, some of them open sourcing them. And I mentioned Bloom just here um, a couple of slides ago as an, a most recent example. Um, let's look quickly into ChatGPT and, and kind of the hype around ChatGPT, right? So large language models is nothing new, right? I think I showed that with a slide. So the industry, we've all been working um, in, in various stages on, on developing those models and improving the architectures. Um, ChatGPT, if we look under the covers um, from what we see and, and what OpenAI shares, um, is fine-tuned from a series of models trained on text and code. Um, called GPT 3.5. So fine tuning is really you you take the large um, pre trained model and then just you know adapt it um, to a specific domain. And um, GPT 3.5 is a is a series of models um, in a specific time range. Um, I think up to Q4 um, 2021 there with the data. And then what JetGPT does, which is really nice, it, it further fine tunes um, this model. It doesn't stop there like we did in the past, right? We had a pre-training phase, we had a fine tuning phase, but JetGPT is further fine tuning it um, using a, a relatively newer technique um, with reinforcement learning and human feedback to improve those results. And the human feedback, those human evaluations, um, help they rate the quality of the text so how good is the response and ensure that the model's goals and the values are aligning with humans meaning um, they, they produce results that are you know not harmful that are that are good quality and what we are expecting um, the model to produce and you can actually see that human feedback, actually, you probably were part of the human feedback, um, maybe without knowing, right? So if you put in a question here, I have the screenshots on the right, um, you can rate the result, right? You can give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, which is human feedback. Um, if you do a thumbs up, you can provide additional feedback, like what would be the ideal answer? And if you say thumbs down, you can provide feedback um, why wasn't it ideal? Like, was it harmful, unsafe? Was it just not true, the answer? Um, or wasn't it helpful? So basically, by doing that, you become a human labeler and a human in the loop and helping, you know, provide feedback that then can be used again in the next fine-tuning phase um, and the next model version. Here's a little bit... Um, a little bit more detail how those stages look, how ChatGPT was trained. Um, the first phase you can see here on the left is basically having a, a prompt data set. So you have a data set with a prompts um, and expected good answers. Um, you take one of those prompts and the answers from that data set and a human labeler goes in and um, and provides the best answer, right? Provides a good desired answer in the step. And this is basically when you provide that feedback um, in the live inference, um, you basically provide here additional inputs to that phase. Um, and then this data, so you have the prompts and you have the like a good desired answer from the human labeler, you can use this data to fine tune um, the model in a supervised learning step. And then OpenAI doesn't stop here for ChatGPT. They do a second phase in which um, they're preparing for the reinforcement learning by training a reward model. So they take another prompt from the data set. Um, they let the model create a couple of responses there. And then the human basically ranks the outputs from the best to the worst. So for example, um, answer D here is the best and then followed by maybe C, A, and B if we do four. And then this data is used to train the reward model to understand, okay, if we have a selection of answers, which one do we perceive the best? 
And then this reward model is used in the third reinforcement step, um, where again, without human interaction, the model can, um, you know, gets a prompt um, from the data set and then running a reinforcement step where it generates an output and the reward model now knows what is perceived a good output. And um, basically the model tries to optimize um, for the best output here. All right, and this is really kind of all together what, what helped make ChatGPT really, really good um, in providing those answers. So a lot of um, human in the loop here um, to make sure the quality is uh, is high. Um, some examples here, it's just funny, um, where you see that the model is actually actively improving. Um, Dr. Andering posted in December, um, he asked the model, why is CPU computation faster than GPU computation, which is not right. <laughs> but the model assumed um, basically here and gave a, a good, fairly good answer why it thinks that CPU is generally faster than GPU computation. Um, if I run the same query right now, I did it just um, a couple of days ago, I put in the same question, and, and you see that ChatGPT actually changed its answer. So now it understands and has learned, probably from human feedback, that GB, GPU computation is generally faster. So here you can literally see how, um, by someone providing that feedback, the model has improved. All right, and with that, um, demo time. Chris, I'm handing over to you. Cool. Good stuff. Great work. Yeah, I wanted you to get the full deck in there since she spent the whole weekend on it. <laughs> um, okay, let me switch over, grab the screen share. So, this is VS Code. <clears throat> And I saw quite a lot of interest um, in the Code Whisperer. Some of you might be familiar with a similar product uh, by GitHub called Copilot. Um, and I don't know, you know what that costs or what the business model is around there, but what's cool about this is it's free and all you need is what's called a builder ID. Uh, so, all you have to do is just go give us your email and uh, you will get <clears throat> what's called a builder ID and you stick that into the extension for Code Whisperer. So, and okay, so here's a quick, so actually this part was generated right before um, Ancha cut over to me. And now I'm gonna, so this is actually using this library called, uh, it, it's called, AWS Wrangler. This used to be called Data Wrangler, but it, it is uh, it was too close to a service that we have called SageMaker Data Wrangler, so they renamed it to just AWS Wrangler. This is an open source project uh, that is pretty cool. So, but like, don't worry about that. Just pretend this is a regular data frame, and all I want to do, I could start typing this group by product category, and calculate average uh, star rating. So this particular data set is the Amazon customer reviews data set. And all I do is click tab here and this actually figured out the code for me and I would just run that. And so this is the exact code that you would need um, for a um, query like this, okay? So that's using the actual data frame. Um, Code Whisper also knows about Modin. It knows about Ray. It you know knows about a whole ton of open or not, sorry projects. Um, and here, this actually was able to generate so query um, query the product category gift card with star rating of five. So this so and then this code actually gets generated, and then I can run that code. It's pretty spooky, actually, unless you start to get used to it. It's actually generating things as you're thinking of it. You know, I code every day, so I'm I'm in there typing, and and sometimes I'll even be you know kind of shocked by what it's suggesting is actually some API that I didn't know existed, or maybe there was a new API that was added to Ray that I didn't know, or to Spark. Um, so it 
also knows pandas. Um, you know, this was 100% generated up here. So this actually generated all from these comments. And so think of this as your prompt. This comment is a prompt, you know, quote unquote. And then what's being generated is this code, okay? Um, let me get to another demo here. <clears throat> so I don't have time to actually run the code. So I ran it right before, but here we're using a pre-trained model from Hugging Face. This is called Bloom 560. You can also get this from uh, SageMaker Jumpstart. It's the same model, it's the same weights. Here, I'm just using the Hugging Face APIs directly, pulling it right into the notebook um, without doing any fine tuning. So again, these are customer reviews and this data set is from, uh, it's from 1995 to 2015. Maybe Ancha can put a quick link in um to the data set and what we're going to do here is first run a uh, first ask the model without being fine-tuned to generate a review for uh, norton antivirus and here we see this model knows nothing or you know very little about norton antivirus um, and it just kind of like goes on and on and babbles and doesn't really give us anything useful. Same with TurboTax. This looks like it's describing maybe a uh, Porsche 911 Turbo, something like that. Uh, doesn't seem related to, uh, oh, let's see, the emission-based car tax system. Okay, so, you know, yeah, maybe a little bit, right? Because this pre-trained model was not trained on these Amazon reviews. We're gonna do that in a second. I've done it already, and then I'll show you the results after. Also Call of Duty. So I trained this specifically on the software customer reviews. Um, here, it doesn't really know much. Uh, knows, you know, maybe there, if there's a PS4 game, um, you know, a little bit. So then we go to actually fine tune it. Now, uh, the data set I set up up here, I just pulled down a you know tiny snippet from this data set just to run inside the notebook. And here we set it up. Um, here we are gonna actually train it. This trained for literally about three minutes right there. So, you know, because I don't have a whole lot of RAM in uh, this particular notebook and I just wanna show a quick demo. So this trained for uh, like under four minutes and now let's see what kind of reviews it's going to give. So Norton Antivirus, uh, so it knows Windows, Mac OS. Um, most people don't understand the event software. So it's you know making a little bit more sense, right? So again, this is only four minutes of training. And then TurboTax it seems to know uh, you would you know potentially download this onto your Mac. There's TurboTax version two. Uh, okay, that's kind of cool. And then Call of Duty. Uh, knows now, you know, some of the later versions or yeah, actually Final Fantasy is a different game, but um, knows when it was released, um, may or may not be right. You know, the that's one of the uh, uh, rather sort of issues with these generative AI models is that sometimes they're really confident and makes you think that that these are the actual facts. And so this is why we fine tune and, you know, retune and then human label. Uh, but we see that this knows a little bit more about what this is than it did before the fine tuning. All right, so that's that one. And then I'm gonna do the stable diffusion one. So this is more on the image to text. And this one, actually we, we pull from Jumpstart, which is SageMaker Jumpstart, which is really just a model hub that you know gives you the ability to set this up on SageMaker and launch these as model endpoints to then make predictions. So all of this code has been generated for you. You don't need to generate anything except um, start to ask it to do things. So I'm going to say, here's my prompt, friendly foes. Show me some, yeah, I'm not very good with the prompts. Yes, Ancha is very creative with her fonts and, and you know describes all kinds of things. Um, I'm a bit more, to the point here. I just want something that represents friendly foes. Okay, that doesn't really look like anything. Uh, King Jeremy the Wicked, uh, Pearl Jam song here. Let's see. Ooh, that, that does look like a pretty wicked king to me. Um, and then what was this one? I think this was also King Jeremy the Wicked, uh, slightly different. 
And yeah, so that's it. And all of this code, I posted the link earlier. You can get in our repo. Um, Ancha, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, still people are excited about Code Whisper and IDE <laughs> integrations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let yeah, us too. let us know. Um, I posted here which ones are supported right now. Um, let us know if you're looking for for any other specific integrations. We're we're happy to pass on the feedback. Um, we're obviously always looking for for inputs. Um, what you would like to see next? Um, question on the example notebook, Chris. You're showing with a Bloom example. Will that be shared? Yep. For sure, that's in this repo right here. And if you want to know what I did this weekend, it was get that to work. So while Ancha was working <laughs> on the slides, I was working on that code this weekend. And then, uh, yeah, you and I will uh, flip flop uh, this week and swap roles because I have right. to make some changes to those slides. So. And I'll go back to the coding here. Yeah. Um, I see the <laughs> feedback people are asking for Rust. Um, I've seen that come up more and more. Um, so yeah, keep the feedback coming. I think um, Rust is here to take and over. And specifically, <laughs> the the Polars project uh, is very very interesting. We're we're trying to track down a good speaker for Polars. Um, the Ray project has actually pulled Polars in as its way of doing Spark like aggregations. So um, I think there's an open pull request from one of the Ray maintainers. Uh, out there that's waiting to get merged. Once that gets merged, we'll be able to use Ray for you know Spark-like things. So yeah, very excited about that, all based on polars. Yeah, the uh, performance, we're seeing it pop up over and over, even internally. Also, we see a lot of uh, like interest from you know the other essays and uh, developer advocates as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for sticking right. around. We'll see you next month, right? Next month with updates to PyTorch 2.0 and more on generative. And more generative. That's right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye.